All right, I see our attendees are starting to arrive here in the Zoom room. Good afternoon and welcome to another session of the Penn State Alumni Association's virtual speaker series. We will be getting started in just a moment. We have a great guest with us today. Kathleen Cahill will be joining us to talk about the suffrage movement in the United States and in particular women's suffrage. If you are joining us here in the Zoom room, let us know who you are and where you're from and your Penn State class year. If you have questions, feel free to drop those in the Q&A box and I will get to as many of those as I can. I would imagine that there might be one or two questions about voting on election day. If you haven't voted yet, I encourage everybody to get out to the polls and cast your vote and have your voice heard in this year's election. We'll be getting started in just a moment. Thank you for joining us on the virtual speaker series. I see Pat Nicolanco from Sea Isle, New Jersey. Pat, always good to see you. And I see Jerry Daniels Elder, parent of a 2020 grad amongst other titles. Carrie Conlon, joining us. Oh, good to see you, Carrie. Thanks for joining us. Pete Sheridan from Blandon, Pennsylvania. Pete, good to see your name. And for those of you who are on Facebook, thank you for joining us as well. We'll be getting started in just a moment. Again, Penn Staters from coast to coast, from Rocky Landers right here in State College to Hillary Kaplan New out in Los Angeles, Julie Barasic in Fairfix, Fairfax, Virginia. I see Bridget Hughes, class of 98, checking in from Seattle, Washington. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association. And I'd like to welcome everybody to today's virtual speaker session, which is being recorded. Live closed captions are available for this event. You can access them by clicking the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom video window, and then clicking show subtitle. You can also customize your caption view by clicking on the stream text link posted in the chat. We are live streaming today's presentation and this live stream has been made possible through the gracious support of a donor and the fund for access ideas on audacious goals. Today's presentation will be archived and available on our website after the event. This afternoon, we welcome Dr. Kathleen Cahill, Associate Professor of History here at Penn State. Turning to today's discussion, the story of the fight for women's suffrage is a familiar one. We know the names of leading suffragists, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Alice Paul, and Carrie Chapman Catt. We remember that suffrage was finally won via the 19th Amendment in 1920, but those facts are only part of the story. Dr. Cahill will reveal the hidden histories of the Native American Chinese American, African American, and Hispanic suffragists who not only challenged women's inequality, but also fought against the racial prejudices of the age. It's good to see you, Dr. Cahill. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Paul. And it's really great to be here with everyone today. I'm, I'm so excited and uh, grateful to the Alumni Association for coordinating all of this. Um, so as I was sort of thinking about what to do today, um, I thought I have a fairly short period of time. And so I'm going to give sort of a brief overview. Um, what I am calling, as you'll see here on my PowerPoint, a very quick history um, of women's suffrage. And 
Um, as I'm telling the story, some of it might be familiar to you, part of that story you might have learned in school, um, but I'm also going to show that women of color were always a part of um, the movement, but weren't always able to take advantage of the benefits of the movement. Um, but I hope that by the end of the presentation, right, the uh, you'll go away knowing that their efforts um, should remind us of the importance of the vote and you know, the many, many people, the many women over many generations who fought for that right. Um, so uh, some of this is drawn from my new book that just came out about two weeks ago called uh, Recasting the Vote, How Women of Color Transformed the Suffrage Movement. And so again, uh, some of this is a broad overview and some of this is more specific to the book. So after the um, American Revolution and with the um, writing of the American Constitution, voting is of course left to the individual states um, to determine who can vote. And with the exception of New Jersey, um, no state said that women could vote. And in New, Jer in New Jersey, um, women are only able to vote between 1797 and 1807 when that is taken away and the word male voters explicitly um, put into the New Jersey state constitution. Um, and really in, in those times, it was only women who had property. Um, so mostly wealthy widows, so really small number. So most women can't vote, but in this time, um, the idea of what was known as Republican motherhood sort of arose, the idea that women could influence politics um, and particularly white women from outside of it, right? So influencing their own husbands um, and raising sons who would be political. Um, but there are two moments of um, antebellum reform activism that leads some women to start questioning this idea of um, you know, just influencing and not having actual political power. Um, and these two reform movements lead them to new political tactics. So the first are the debates around the Cherokee removal um, and really the removal of all of the five so-called civilized tribes from the Southeast to Oklahoma, what becomes Oklahoma, right, to Indian territory. Um, Cherokee women are petitioning against this and through uh, Northern missionaries in places like Georgia, Northern white women learn of this and they too begin to um, petition and there are massive petition drives throughout the North um, against the removal and in favor of the Cherokee keeping their land. Now, as you know, um, Andrew Jackson famously ignores the Supreme Court decision that upholds their treaty rights um, and removes them anyway. Um, but Northern white women um, have some really useful political experience through this. And they bring that experience with them into the abolitionist movement, which of course, again, you um, probably remember is a biracial um, and mixed sex movement, right? Black men and women, white men and women in this. And again, they make great use of petitions. Um, again, thousands of anti-slavery petitions um, from across the North are sent to Congress. Um, so much so that in 1836, Congress passes what becomes known as the gag rule um, that tables all anti-slavery petitions, right? It, it, they're too annoying. They keep bringing up this question of slavery. Um, and so they, Congress literally says, we're not gonna consider any of them. And so again, some women start to question uh, their political disenfranchisement, right? This one avenue of political voice is cut off for them. So that uh, leads uh, to the famous Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention of 1848. Um, white women uh, organize this and they uh, are thinking about their rights. Um, again, coming out of these movements that they've been in for uh, Native Americans and African Americans. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott um, use the Declaration of Independence and famously rewrite it into their Declaration of Sentiments to criticize um, women's lack of rights, right? And they famously rewrite the opening to, we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men and women are created equal. And then they list a series of grievances where women are not equal. Um, and the final grievance was the one that was most contested and the only one that wasn't unanimously um, voted in, which was the right to vote. 
Um, this was something not all women were sure about. That was really quite radical. And um, it's not until Frederick Douglass, the famous African-American abolitionist, um, stands up and supports that as one of the things that should be included, that it is. So um, during the Civil War, the women's rights movement is kind of on hold as um, most, uh, well, in the North, uh, women are really advocating right, for the Union. But after the war and with the um, debates over this, the Reconstruction Amendments, it comes up again. So the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments come out of Reconstruction. And um, the 14th in 1868 famously uh, creates birthright citizenship, which means African Americans are now recognized as citizens, which they hadn't been. But it also inserts the words male voter into the Constitution. Um, and then the next one, the 15th Amendment, which is ratified in 1870, and I want to note that it's the 150th anniversary of that amendment this year, um, that amendment is put in place to protect voters by race, right? Uh, the right to vote shall not be denied on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Um, and it's as that um, amendment is working its way into the Constitution that the suffrage movement really splits over it. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, and Susan B. Anthony um, are very frustrated and break they're frustrated that sex isn't included and they break from their um, abolitionist allies to argue that educated white women should be enfranchised before, as they say, ignorant black men, right? Former, formerly enslaved black men. Um, and uh, as I said, the movement really fractures over this. Um, Frederick Douglass famously disagrees, arguing that um, and he says at one of the women's rights conventions, quote, when women, because they are women, are dragged from their homes and hung upon lampposts, when their children are torn from their arms and their brains dashed out upon the pavement, then they will have the urgency to obtain the ballot, end quote. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton says, well, but what about Black women, and, right? They experience that. And he replies, well, that is happening not because they are women, but because they are Black. And Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who you see here, who is, a, a, again, a, a major uh, women's rights advocate and abolitionist, offered Black women's perspective. Um, she stated at a convention, quote, we are all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity, and society cannot trample on the weakest and feeblest of its members without receiving the curse in its own soul. Um, so she really challenges white women like Stanton and Anthony um, to think beyond themselves, right? And she said, white women speak of rights, but I speak of wrongs. And arguing that, right, until black women who are the most sort of disenfranchised people in the country are, uh, have rights, then really the, the, the nation has a long way to go. So um, this split is significant, uh, but suffragists, black and white, are still pushing for enfranchisement, and they try um, what becomes known as the new departure, which is to say, um, you know, maybe we could just argue that women have the right to vote because they are citizens. And a number of them, um, including Sojourner Truth and Susan B. Anthony, just go to the polls in 1872 and just try to vote. Um, and, and what they're trying to do is get arrested, which Anthony is, um, and bring a court case that will eventually go to the Supreme Court and they hope to win on this argument that, that they can vote because they're citizens. So Anthony does, her case gets thrown out so she doesn't go to the Supreme Court but um, Virginia Minor there on the right does and unfortunately loses um, in 1875 in the case Minor v. Happerstadt where the court rules that the 14th Amendment says male voter and so Congress clearly did not mean women. So the movement has split, um, it's lost um, it, the new departure strategy. And at that moment, the sort of um, strategy really moves to a state by state strategy. Um, and this is very successful as you can see from this map in the American West, all of those states in white um, enfranchise women um, beginning with Wyoming territory in 1869. But um, this tends to be limited to white women. And for many of those states, it's a way to encourage white women to move um, into what are fairly new states, right? Um, so now I wanna point out that um, suffragists are also fighting a cultural battle. 
um, we can think of these postcards as the memes of their day, right? That people were sending to each other. Um, and the argument, the anti-suffrage arguments that you see here um, are that women in politics will destroy the family, right? Um, the gender roles will be flipped upside down so that men will have to do domestic chores and take care of the children. Um, that women who advocate for suffrage are bad mothers, right? They're ignoring their children or they're old maids um, who are, as you see here, ugly and plain and unwomanly, right? And um, you see very similar tropes in uh, using women of color in these postcards as well. And I just wanna give you a warning of some of the language on these. Um, so again, this idea of reversing gender roles, um, but also once women of color are part of this, it, it also suggests that they don't have legitimate grievances in the same way it's suggesting that white women's grievances aren't legitimate to make fun of them in this way. So um, suffragists counter these arguments with images of right, beautiful women, um, allegorical figures, but also by in their parades and on stage, um, you know, putting forth kind of their uh, young, beautiful women. Because of the racial ideas of the day, these are always white women um, in the sort of mainstream movements. Um, you can see here from the Pennsylvania State Campaign of 1915, and I'm wearing my pin uh, from eBay, uh, the way in which, again, this, this beautiful figure here. Um, they also, in these state-by-state -state campaigns, really use um, sort of local uh, meaningful things. So the Liberty Bell in Pennsylvania is quite prominent, um, and the, a replica, suffragists take a replica around the state. I wanted to show you a couple things from our um, archives here at Penn State. Um, these were posters that went up in the 1915 campaign. And again, you see how suffragists are trying to counter those negative images by showing again, um, these sort of beautiful womanly figures. This woman is voting to protect her child and the home. She's in contrast to the sort of corrupt politician who's under the influence of vice and graft. Um, and vice especially being the liquor interests, because of course this is the moment of um, temperance and prohibition. Um, and you see that in particular in this one, uh, which is a, a pro-suffrage uh, poster that's showing the antis as um, clearly, right, the liquor interests. Their Liberty Bell is this whiskey bottle, but also arguably potentially um, kind of German immigrants um, or immigrants of some kind who don't speak proper English, right? And the sort of implication is um, they are not necessarily good men, right? And good men are the men not on the truck who are saying, right, they're ignoring this um, effort to, um, to, to be anti-suffrage. So, um, so um, black women are also continuing to advocate for suffrage, but they often have to be in their own um, organizations for a number of reasons. One, um, white suffrage organizations don't always accept them. Um, and even when they are sort of biracial organizations, um, and there are some, um, they aren't always addressing the specific issues that the African American community is hoping that suffrage will address. And this is particularly issues of racial violence, right? The rising um, tide of Jim Crow laws in the South um, and, and just general prejudice, right? So uh, this is a picture of Pennsylvania club women. It's from 1923, but a number of the women, including the two, um, the, the two big pictures on the top right and left um, were, were big suffrage advocates in um, Pennsylvania. So as I said, this is uh, the strategy had been kind of a state by state um, effort. The Pennsylvania effort to pass it in 1915 fails. Um, and there's sort of some rumblings um, and a growing sense of uh, this is taking a lot of effort. Some states like South Dakota had six different um, votes over several decades. Um, and so women are putting a lot of effort into this and it's, it's not really moving as, fastly, as fast as they want. So coming back to the idea of a constitutional amendment is looking good. And in 1913, um, Alice Paul, um, young Alice Paul, um, comes to the United States and she really pushes for this. So she's 
She's born in New Jersey, but she had spent some time in England with the radical suffragists there, right? We think of Mary Poppins, um, right? Sister Suffragette, which was again, kind of making fun of this, but the suffragists in England were really quite radical. And Paul is influenced by them. She comes back um, to the US. She actually writes her dissertation in 1912 at uh, University of Pennsylvania, not Penn State. Uh, and it's on the legal status of women. And then she really pushes for this amendment. And what she does is she um, convinces the National American Women's Suffrage Association to hold this huge parade in Washington, DC. It's the first national protest parade in Washington. Um, it's the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. And as you can see um, on the left, the folk that opens the parade is this demand for a constitutional amendment for women's suffrage. Um, what's interesting about this parade is it sort of shows um, the different experiences women of color have in working with these um, mainstream white suffrage organizations. So some women of color are invited to participate in the parade. And in the bottom left, you see here, um, this was a float of uh, nations working for um, women's suffrage. And on the far right hand side of the float is a Chinese woman carrying the flag of the new Chinese Republic, um, which had had a Republican revolution, not the communist revolution in 1911. Um, and women's rights were really a big part of that initially. And um, so suffragists in the United States are very interested in um, learning more about that and often invite Chinese women in the US, Chinese American women to talk to them about this. Um, but African-American women also wanted to participate in this parade and Alice Paul really discourages them, initially tries to avoid them altogether um, and then says, well, you'll have to march in the back of the parade. Um, and ultimately they reject this. Um, and you see here Ida B. Wells um, marching with the Illinois state delegation and African-American women do march throughout the parade. The biggest group um, is a group of students from Howard University, the historically black um, university in DC and now famous as Kamala Harris's um, alma mater. And um, particularly uh, the Delta Sigma Theta sorority uses this parade as its first public um, event. It's newly founded. But uh, the reason Alice Paul had not wanted them to participate is she's very worried about um, alienating Southern white politicians who were absolutely um, adamantly against uh, black women's suffrage for sure, but they worried that the question of women's suffrage altogether would open up the question of um, the disenfranchisement of black men, right? Talking about a constitutional amendment would remind people of the 15th amendment, but also remind them that Jim Crow laws had disenfranchised African-American men, many of them, right, on the basis of race. So they do not want to bring this up and Alice Paul doesn't want to alienate them. Um, there's another uh, group of women of color in the parade, not group, um, a woman who's invited. And this is uh, Marie Botno Baldwin, who's um, a member of the Turtle Mountain Chippewa Nation from North Dakota. She was living in Washington, DC, uh, working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and going to school at um, the Washington College of Law, which was a law school for uh, women, founded by women, and it was a hotbed of suffrage activism. It's now the American University Law School. Um, suffragists actually ask her to um, create a float that will demonstrate the matriarchal traditions of some native nations. Um, and this was something they're very interested in, and it often opened up a space where native suffragists could come and speak to white suffragists because of their interest in these traditions, and then native suffragists would talk about um, what one of them called the um, problems of the Indian of today. So the more contemporary issues that they face under Marie Baldwin's um, employer, the Indian Bureau, which was trying to um, destroy native cultures, uh, was no longer recognizing native, native governments and trying to um, assimilate native people into the citizenry and get rid of kind of any trace of, of native uh, culture. So she's asked to, to create a float, right, which is a really different thing from the African American women. She ultimately chooses not to, instead of um, kind of thinking about this as looking backwards, 
um, she puts forth um, kind of an image of the future, which is of herself marching with the lawyers wearing her cap and gown. Um, and as I said, I just want to kind of remind us that Black women, including Black women in Pennsylvania, continue to fight uh, for the right to vote. You can see in the bottom right, um, they're very proud of their participation in the 1913 parade, and they fight um, for that 1915 state um, suffrage referendum that fails. So the, the state by state strategy keeps going even as the constitutional amendment strategy is moving forward. And um, again, women in Pennsylvania are part of that. You see them here picketing the White House, which um, Alice Paul and her organization, new organization, the National Women's Party move toward this more radical um, efforts. They do this during the war, World War I, um, and they're very critical of Wilson, and this draws criticism to them. Um, but other women under Carrie Chapman Catt and NASA are um, emphasizing women's war work, and they have a very sophisticated lobbying machine that's lobbying Congress. And so um, Congress does pass the amendment in June of 1919 and sends it out to the states for ratification. Um, it's ratified in August 1920, that was this year, August 18th. Um, here, Alice Paul is sewing a star for each state that ratifies. Um, and it in Tennessee is the final, the perfect 36 necessary. And then the women don't stop, right? There's an election in you know two months and they hit the ground running. Um, they institute suffrage schools to encourage women uh, to register and to vote. The League of Women Voters is founded, right, again, to get out women's votes. And that election took place 100 years ago yesterday. That was that election in 1920. Um, Black women are part of this. They register to vote. Um, they try to register to vote. Um, in the North, they're successful. Um, and they take part in uh, voting. In the South, they run into those same Jim Crow laws and are unable to vote and are disenfranchised, right? Um, in the North where they can vote, they tend to use their vote uh, to focus on, again, the violence of lynching in particular um, and some of the, the urban riots that have been aimed at their community. They hope that they can use federal legislation to address this white supremacy that's really out in the open in the South. Um, Native women are also not necessarily enfranchised in 1920, right? If Southern Black women are kept from voting, Native women, um, many of whom are considered uh, legally wards of the government and not citizens, right? If the, the, they're considered legally wards. And so um, they don't have a voice in US government and the US government does not recognize their Native government. So they're sort of left powerless. So native suffragists continue to push um, for US citizenship and the right to vote. Um, Gertrude Bonin, whom you see here, or Zip Kalasa, uh, actually taught at the Carlisle Indian School and brings her criticism of federal policies from that personal experience. And she keeps advocating for this. And in 1924, uh, Congress does pass the Indian Citizenship Act, but many Native people are still disenfranchised at the state level, um, either by literacy tests and poll taxes, um, but also if they live on reservations, a lot of states refuse to let them vote. So for many women of color, um, it's not until the 1960s and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, right, that the civil rights movement brings in, um, that women um, from many of these communities are actually able to cast a ballot. Um, 1965 is also the year that the first woman of color, Patsy Takamoto Mink from Hawaii is elected to Congress. Um, and so again, 1965 is a major watershed year and you do begin to see more women of color running for office um, and voting and participating. Um, but of course, we have to remember that the 2013 Supreme Court case of Shelby v. Holder really stripped uh, the Voting Rights Act of a lot of its um, um, ability to, um, a lot of its teeth, right? Um, so that reminds us, and of course today on election day, we are reminded that the right to vote is precious. Um, it was hard fought. It is um, still remains um, something that people need to be vigilant about to keep. Um, and I will end there and I'm happy to talk about any of this or answer any other questions that you might have. Um, so thank you.
Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Cahill. Uh, if you have questions for Dr. Cahill, you can enter them in the Q&A tab on the bottom. Uh, first question that came in uh, actually as part of registration, women were allowed to vote in some Western states prior to 1919. Was that vote ever taken away or were they allowed to just continue to vote unimpeded? That's a good question. Um, and I see someone in the chat from Taos, New Mexico, and that's where I formerly lived, so hello. Um, so in the American West, as you saw, yeah, um, large numbers of women were able to vote. The only place that it was ever taken away was actually from women in Utah. Um, and as I, uh, I think I mentioned, um, part of what was going on in Utah is that the Mormons were trying to protect uh, their religion. And so they enfranchised Mormon women in 1870 um, right, to, to give themselves a greater number of voters. And the Edmunds Tucker Act of 1887, um, the federal government um, outlaws polygamy. It was a huge issue. Um, and when Utah is accepted um, as a state in 1890, um, the federal government actually does strip uh, women of the voting rights in Utah. And it's because of this, uh, because it's seen as a support for the Mormon church and for polygamy. Um, it's the only time the federal government has done that. But in all of the other states, women are able to vote. And part of that state by state strategy was if um, suffragists could get enough of the congressional delegation, uh, right, enough members of Congress beholden to women voters, right, then Congress could pass federal legislation. So, um, you know, the, the Western states have fairly small congressional delegations. So the big prizes are like New York, which um, has a couple of um, elections. So 1915, uh, it loses, and then it's finally passed in 1917. And that's the biggest congressional delegation. But as I said, it's a really slow process. And, um, you know, <laughs> women don't always vote uh, in, there's a sense that they will vote, right, and push for women's suffrage, or they will support this, and they don't always, right? They once they get the right to vote, they do go into the different political parties um, and support them for a variety of reasons. And so um, that state by state strategy is just not working fast enough for most people, and that's why they turn to to the alternative. Is there anything to be gleaned from kind of the geographic progression of the right to vote? Were the Western states at that time more progressive or was there practical reasons? Um, you know, it's an interesting question and it definitely is one that scholars debate about. Um, so on one hand, as I said, it's seen in some cases, it's very much about attracting women to the West. But what's interesting is actually um, even, you know, when the West was the Midwest, uh, those states had many fewer um, uh, sort of uh, property right qualifications um, on even male voters in the early, like the 1820s and 30s when they're being, when they're coming into statehood. And again, it was a, an effort to attract people to those states by making it easier to vote for men. Um, and so it, that's kind of been a trend um, that in that early period, it's, it's making it easier for men without property or with little property to vote, right? A class right. issue. Um, but in the far West, it's, it's white women in particular. Um, what's interesting about New Mexico, which I write about in my book, is there the state constitution um, did two things that made it really hard for women suffragists. One, on one hand, um, and this was advocated for by Spanish speaking women who were part of this, the constitution of New Mexico protects Spanish language rights and freedom of religion, which was to protect the Catholic religion because the majority of people in New Mexico were um, Hispanic or you know, um, former Mexican citizens who after the Treaty of Guadalupe become US citizens. But in order to protect that, they um, make it extremely difficult to amend the New Mexico constitution so that you can't take voting rights away from Spanish speakers. Right but it's only Spanish speaking men. So suffragists in New Mexico cannot use that state strategy because it's, it's basically impossible to change the constitution. So they end up really focusing both um, Anglo and Hispanic women on the constitutional amendment. 
So help help me kind of think through the concepts of citizenship and and voting rights. You would think if you're a citizen of a country that part of the definition of citizenship would be the right to vote. Is, is that not, um, are the two concepts not tied to each other? They're not. They have become much more tied to each other over the course of the 20th century. Um, but what's so interesting, and I, I learned this, right? I too went into this project thinking about citizenship and suffrage is really, right? You're a citizen, you get to vote. But um, that's not how it was in the 19th century. There is no constitutional right to vote, right? We don't have one um, and um, arguably we should. Um, the, the women's suffrage amendment like the 15th amendment, it's actually based on the 15th. It doesn't say all women have the right to vote. It says the right to vote shall not be denied on the basis of sex. That leaves open a whole bunch of other ways the right to vote can be denied and and was denied, right? Um, also, what's really interesting is in the 19th century, um, non-citizens could vote, but citizens could not. So we saw how women argued, we're citizens, we should be able to vote. And the Supreme Court said no. Um, at the same time, there were upwards of 22 states that allowed immigrant men who said, who basically, they were called first paper voters. So if they started the process of naturalizing, becoming naturalized citizens, um, they were allowed to vote. Now, a lot of them didn't necessarily finish the naturalization process, um, but no one was really keeping track of this. The federal government wasn't sort of following this. It was, there was a lot less concern about immigration at the time, um, except for Chinese immigrants. And I write about this in the book. Um, in 1882, Congress passes the Chinese Exclusion Act, which excludes uh, the vast majority of Chinese immigrants says they can't come in, also says that any, the very few that can, um, and it's like teachers, merchants, and um, diplomats, they cannot become naturalized citizens. The 14th Amendment doesn't apply to them. So, um, so there are lots of ways in which citizenship does matter, um, but it also doesn't matter as much in the 19th century. And part of what white suffragists do um, when they're arguing about why white women should have suffrage is really use um, anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric, right? And this anti-nativist rhetoric in the same way that they did with African-Americans to say, how come these immigrant men who might not even speak English um, can vote, but native born white women who are citizens and upper middle class can't vote, right? And that, especially during World War I with the anti-German nativism, that's a really compelling argument and it's partially why suffrage is successful in that moment. Excellent. Uh, so, so you mentioned Jim Crow laws, you mentioned poll taxes, you mentioned literacy um, tests. After the after women were granted the right to vote, did they see some of the same barriers put in place that African Americans faced? So um, white women, not really, except um, well, let me take that back. Yes, uh, what you see in the American South, where those Jim Crow laws are in place. Um, voter turnout is really low across the board. They have just abysmal rates of voting um, in part because those laws do depress um, turnout for everybody. Um, the poll tax in particular is tough. Um, women don't necessarily control the household um, budget, right? And so if their husbands aren't willing to pay for them, pay the poll tax for them, they might not be able to vote. Um, some households couldn't afford to pay two for two, right? Um, but also, you know, those, and, and you could get around literacy tests because the county registrar was the one that gave them out and they could, you know, and they did, right? The uh, African-American could come in and read it perfectly well. And they'd say like, you clearly can't read. Um, if someone, a white person came who couldn't read as well, they could let them through, right? Because that right. single person is in charge. But, but you do see that in those states with, um, those regressive laws, voter turnout for whites and blacks is really quite low. And for Mexican Americans in Texas who are really hit hard by poll taxes and literacy tests as well. 
So once the right to vote was granted, how did the um, how did the movement shift to encourage mm -hmm. uh, women to actually then get out to vote? Um, it's it's one thing to have the right to do it; it's mm -hmm. another thing to get out to the polls. Were were the same activists for suffrage then activists for um, to, for the get out to vote movement? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, it's not necessarily uniform, right? So, so women of color and particularly black women um, continue to fight for Southern black women, right? And they go to Alice Paul and the National Women's Party. They go to um, the National Association, uh, sorry, National American Women's Suffrage Association leaders and say, the fight isn't over, right? In the South, they're ignoring the Susan B. Anthony Amendment as they called it. Right. Um, and they, they get a, a little bit of traction, not with Alice Paul, but with um, uh, the NASA. But um, those two white organizations really moved to turn out the vote. So um, NASA, National American Women's Suffrage Association, actually turns into the League of Women Voters, right? So they're no longer a suffrage organization, now they are the League of Women Voters. And um, as I showed, they, they really are working to educate women um, to try to turn them out. They're nonpartisan, very deliberately nonpartisan. There was an idea that um, women would sort of one of the arguments that suffragists made we saw was that women would be voting for women and children and for the home and that they brought a different uh, sensibility to politics than men. And there was a the sense that women wouldn't become part of the political parties, um, that there would be kind of a women's vote. And Alice Paul forms the National Women's Party and attempts to sort of mobilize women in that way. In the same way, the League of Women Voters likewise is nonpartisan. Uh, women do end up going into these parties um, pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but of course, we also know that Alice Paul and the National Women's Party um, like the idea of, a, of an amendment and they begin very quickly to advocate for the Equal Rights Amendment, right? So now not just women can vote, but women um, should have full equality. And Alice Paul does sort of say to the black women who come to her worried about disenfranchisement that um, the Equal Rights Amendment will fix that, um, but she's not really, that's not her priority, right? Um, it is interesting thinking of sort of people of color that uh, the, the Equal Rights Amendment is introduced um, in Congress for the first time in 1923 in the House and the Senate. And the man who introduces it in the Senate is um, Senator Charles Curtis, who's from Kansas. He will become Herbert Hoover's vice presidential uh, running mate. And he himself is Native American. Um, and in fact, the National Women's Party ends up endorsing Hoover because of their relationship with Curtis and his introduction of the ERA for them. So, um, yes, uh, it's it's complex. It's complex, and there's a lot of different um, movements. But both of the major suffrage kind of national organizations definitely move to getting women to vote to turn them out. Uh, let Let's stick. Let's stick with that kind of um, after they've kind of post suffrage and talk about um, was there a gap between getting the right to vote and then the ability to run for office? So when did women get the ability to then pursue public office? Mm -hmm. um, so it depends state by state. Um, the first woman to um, be elected to Congress is Jeanette Rankin from Montana in 1917, right? So Montana had um, enfranchised women before uh, that. In New Mexico, to take the example I write about, um, they had to change the constitution because it said only men could run for office. Um, now, luckily that the part that was really hard to change was only about who could vote. So it was easier to amend the rest of the constitution. So um, both of the parties are, the Democrats and the Republicans are um, courting these new female voters. And so both of them support changing the constitution in New Mexico to allow for women to run for office, which they do in a special election in 1921. And then in 1922, both parties nominate um, female candidates uh, the Republican Party actually nominates Nina Otero Warren, who had been a major suffrage activist um, and bilingual woman who advocated 
um, particularly for Spanish um, women. And they nominate her as their candidate for Congress um, in 1922. Uh, the Democrats uh, nominate a woman named Soledad Chavez de Chacon, again, another um, Spanish speaker, bilingual woman for uh, state, uh, Secretary of State. Nina Otara Warren loses her election. It's actually a bad year for the Republicans in New Mexico generally that year, but Soledad Chavez de Chacon wins and this makes her the first woman to serve as Secretary of State in the United States and the first woman of color elected to state office. Um, so yeah, 1922. That's amazing. So uh, uh, Pat Nicolano has put in the chat, uh, PBS has a wonderful documentary on women suffragists. If you wish to uh, hear more about this topic called Jod Angels, uh, any comment about the documentary? So that is a good one. There's also, um, they came out with one this summer called The Vote. Um, and a lot of states had um, sort of funding to do things at the state level around that. So there were a lot of podcasts. Right. Um, I know New Mexico had one, New York State had one. Um, and these are great. And the fun thing about them is, right, all of the visuals. And for this most recent one called The Vote, um, they, they colored a lot of the images. So we're used to seeing them in black and white, but they, they actually um, did the sort of recolored them and, and it, it changes the way you look at it, right? It, it really kind of makes it a lot more um, of a visceral feeling. And they've done a good job of incorporating a lot of the new scholarship. I see one of the questions in the chat is about yeah. black scholars studying African-American women suffragists and absolutely right. And my work, 100% is indebted to them. Um, and the new documentary really includes some of that, um, that scholarship. The woman I would, the book I would really recommend is another new book called Vanguard by Martha Jones. Um, that's just phenomenal. Um, and looks at uh, black women's struggle for voting rights from reconstruction to civil rights. Um, so yeah. yeah. So talk about the process of, of writing the book. Uh, I would imagine on a topic like this, there's probably more information than you could possibly want to fit in one book. So what made it, what didn't make it, maybe more importantly, and kind of what were the big aha moments? Yeah, it was a really tough book to write, um, partly because, um, as you say, there, there was actually a lot more than I expected, right? Initially, people often say, oh, there's no information on, on these women. They're just not in the archive. Um, one thing that has changed over, even since I wrote my first book, so just a decade almost, has been the digitization of newspapers. Um, and Penn State has, we have, um, our library has a, a, a number of those, those databases. And you can search for people by name. Um, and that you could never have done this on microfilm. I don't know if any of you used microfilm, um, but you, you, know, you could maybe go through a couple years of one paper. In this way, you can search these nas you know, national databases and really follow women and get these little bits of their life that then you can put together. So for my book, what I ended up doing is looking at six women, kind of a collective biography. Um, so three are native women, um, Marie Botno Baldwin and Gertrude Bonin, whom I spoke about, and then another woman who's Wisconsin Oneida named Laura Cornelius Kellogg, um, an African American poet and club woman named Carrie Williams Clifford, um, a Chinese woman who cannot become a citizen but lives in the US from the age five, uh, five to her death, named Mabel Pinwa Lee, um, and then Nina Otero Warren from New Mexico. Um, and so I tried to use their stories. Um, to, to show, you know, A, how women of color were involved in suffrage and why they were involved, right? What motivated them? Um, and then how their stories somewhat overlapped, right? They all faced racial prejudice. They all faced um, sort of difficulties there, but they, that wasn't always, um, wasn't always the same kind of prejudice or in the same ways. Um, so their stories are similar, but they also diverge. And then the really hard part was to try to kind of tell those stories in a way that, um, you know, wove together. And so it wasn't like reading, it kind of didn't kind of awkwardly shift from one to another, which I hope I succeeded in uh, more of a braided narrative that, that 
shows you the sort of change over time and the excitement of um, you know, these major campaigns. These are really sophisticated political campaigns as well as um, how these individual women were experiencing them and, and, and influencing them. So a uh, question about terminologies come in. Um, I just learned that the term suffragette was seen as offensive. Uh, until today, I had not heard of the word suffragist. Mm -hmm. Is it still an important distinction? Yeah, so um, in Britain, they were often referred to as suffragettes, um, but not in the United States. In the US, that was only used as a pejorative, right? It's, um, it's a diminutive. Uh, and so it is a way, it was a way of, um, you know, kind of dismissing these women as not really very serious. It gets used a lot, but it's usually by aunties or kind of just general, right? You'll see it in the newspapers a lot, kind of men commenting on the movement, but in a way that's, that's dismissive of it. So, but yeah, people tend to kind of conflate the two, but when you go back, you see that the, the women fighting for the right to vote did not use it to refer to themselves. So now women have the right to vote. Uh, how does that change political campaigns moving forward? Uh, those who might've been opposed to women having the right to vote now have to court them as voters. And so um, how I, I would imagine that although I, I would acknowledge that it was, there were gender politics certainly before that time period. Certainly it is, um, it is more apparent after 1920. Yeah, again, there initially was this idea uh, that there'd be a women's block, right? You could sort of capture that, um, that group and, and the, the parties try um, early on when it becomes a little more apparent that women um, are also going to be partisan, most of them, um, there's less catering to them. So right out of the gate, right in 1920, 1921, um, again, you see the parties putting women into positions in the state central committees. You see them um, sending women as delegates to the national conventions with, with in New Mexico, you see them, right, initially putting women up for office. Um, when they sort of realize women don't necessarily continue to demand that as voters, right? And they're not all voting kind of together on that. Um, it, it doesn't continue um, in, that, in that early 20th century. Um, I would say something we see now though is, right? There is, in some ways there is, we talk a lot about the gender gap in politics and there is one um, but the place you see it most is if you talk about Black women, right? Black women vote, vote in, in the early 20th century, they were voting solidly Republican. That, of course, changes mid-century when the Democrats support the um, voting rights and civil rights um, legislation, um, and now solidly Democrat, right? Like 96%. Um, and in a lot of ways, they are emblematic of what politicians are always chasing, which is the women, the women's vote, right? But but white women, um, Latinas, um, split a little more, not completely evenly. There is a gender gap, but um, not as dramatically as with African American women. Um, but they do determine, right? They do determine elections, and we we see this this year, right? The chasing of the suburban mother's vote, right? right. Um, so that is definitely part of our politics still. Um, and I would say the other thing um, is the way in which female candidates still run into some of these stereotypes um, that we saw with suffragists, right? Um, this question of, you know, we see motherhood brought up around female candidates um, and female politicians a lot more than you see the questions of fatherhood. Um, you know, that's usually not the immediate question asked of men um, who are in office or running for office, but it is still for women. Um, and there's still ways in which what a woman wears or how she looks and presents um, are very much part of the dialogue. And as you saw, that was part of how the, the tension um, and the struggle of, um, in the suffrage movement, right? What do women in politics look like um, and what is an acceptable way for them to look? And women still confront that. 
So are there populations within our country that are still disenfranchised? Absolutely, right? Um, yeah, 100%. Um, the ways of distant, and here, one of the books I had on, uh, very quickly on that suggested reading slide, Carol Anderson's book, um, I think it's One Person, No Vote, is a really great overview of um, starting in the 1890s, uh, that, that the ways of disenfranchisement are no longer really explicitly um, using race, but they still are targeting specific groups. Um, so to give you an example from um, 2016 in North Dakota, uh, the state refused to, um, basically you had to have a street address in order to register to vote. Well, on reservations, there's not, the infrastructure on reservations, native reservations is still really subpar. And a lot of people don't have street addresses. Um, the federal government hasn't put them in, tribal governments can't necessarily afford to do that. So they don't have that. So then, right, that disenfranchised the native population, which in North Dakota is a significant chunk of people. Um, you know, and so voter ID laws um, are often, right, what you can or cannot use um, is another way of, of doing that. So tribal ID cards um, from native tribes um, are not accepted by a lot of states, which again sort of has the effect of disenfranchising native people. Um, you know, in Florida, the sort of um, overturning of felony convictions, which Floridians voted to allow um, former felons to vote, but then the state said, oh, but they can't vote until they have paid off their, um, right, their fines. Uh, that's a way of keeping a certain population from voting when the vast majority of, uh, right, where African Americans are incarcerated at a much higher rate than other populations. So, so they're not um, as explicitly race-based, but they are often very strategic strategically targeted to keep certain enough of a certain group from voting that it will advantage um, other people. And of course, gerrymandering, which we could talk about too. Absolutely. Uh, but we can't talk about it today because we are out of time. Uh, that's all the time we have. Dr. Cahill, thanks for joining us. Uh, I also want to thank all those who have tuned in to the virtual speaker session. Thank you for tuning in uh, to hear today's presentation. As a reminder, we'll be hosting additional sessions in the coming weeks and months and this programming is in addition to a wide array of career networking opportunities that we have in career programs. You can find all of our virtual programs on our website at alumni.psu.edu slash events. Thanks again and we are. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>